Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're going to be reviewing This Was by Jethro Tull. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm going to give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. I'm just looking at my eyeliner right now and I noticed this like over here it looks like I've completely screwed up the way that I did it but I didn't it just like kind of erased itself so you know that's what happens when you put eyeliner all day but anyway here are some of my favorite bits from this album. So we are 166 episodes into this series and so far we've encountered multiple debut albums by various bands. Some of them are their small bands which only even have one album, some of them are bands that basically went forgotten in time with one album or their first album, some of them are big bands, but none of them are probably as big as today's band which is of course the magnificent Jethro Tull. Now for a long time I've wanted to go ahead and listen to this first album by by the way, I am a huge Tall fan, I haven't listened to a lot of their discography, but what I do know, I know pretty well, I've listened to it over and over and over again. My personal favorite album by theirs is Thick as a Brick, I think it's better than Aqualung, so you know, go and fight me down in the comments if you really feel like doing so, but for a long time I really wanted to know what their first album sounded like, and I got the opportunity to do that just here today. So if there's one constant of Jethro Tall right from the beginning up until their latest album, which which is the Zealot Gene, it is Ian Anderson. Ian Anderson has always been the frontman for Jethro Tull, he has always been present on every album, and he's definitely the most well-associated person when it comes to the band. But if the universe has its way and it would have done something a bit different, we might have never got Jethro Tull we actually liked, and Jethro Tull would be a completely different band known for a completely different type of music, and it all comes down to one person called Meek Abrams. I kind of said his name really oddly, his name is Meek Abrahams, that sounds better. And Meek Abrahams, you might be asking yourself, for those of you who know Jethro Tull on the surface level like me and you don't know who that person is, well Meek Abrahams was actually one of the founding members of Jethro Tull. He played the guitar and did some vocals on this one and definitely was a huge leading role in the artistic direction for this album, but as it seems he and Ian Anderson both had quite different ideas for what this band should become. The term artistic differences is nothing new, we hear it time and time again and it either makes or breaks a band and it happens a lot of times and this time it could have totally broke Jethro Tull or at least not let it be what it became to be but as we later saw Ian Anderson had his upper hand and the band went his own progressive way. But what Mick Abrams actually wanted to do with the band is what you mostly hear on their first album and that's going in the direction of blues. Yes, you've heard me right. If you don't know this album, this is basically a blues album. If you like blues, you might as well enjoy this one. I don't know blues that well. I haven't really, you know, listened to anything, at least not from my own accord. But I really do like this type of music, although it's not my favorite. But I do really appreciate the influence that blues had on the appearance and emergence of progressive rock later on. And seeing as this album was recorded in 1968 and released in 1969, I am not that surprised to see that this album isn't the proggy masterpiece that we've loved and got from Jethro Tull along the years. This of course was written and recorded and created before prog was even a coined term and you know nothing was basically understood but definitely you can see how Jethro Tull were part of the pioneers of taking all of these you know classical music influences blues even some jazz and of course rock and combining them all to create this new and amazing subgenre of rock. But the thing is that Ian Anderson, Mick Abrams and the other people who are of course involved in creating this album they didn't really go on well and there was definitely some artistic differences which promptly led Mick Abrams 
Abrams to leave the band right after this album was finished and created. But there was actually one thing missing for the album at the time and that was a name and the name given is This Was and it's basically a very meta way of looking at what was happening at the time when the band said you know what this is our album but this is not what we are going to continue making from now on thus this is what was. And the band did actually go on to create better things and it all you know gradually culminated up to albums like Aqualung and Thick as a Brick which are completely amazing and even the later works as we've heard on Stormwatch are definitely great bangers to listen to which sound nothing like what we hear on here. But yeah this album really isn't prog at all like I wouldn't even say that you really have any hints of prog in it. Some things might not be you know as structured as you might expect from basic songwriting but again it's really not prog quite yet but we do still get some really lovely music on here that I genuinely enjoy. So you've got a song like My Sunday Feeling which is the first ever track by basically Jethro Tull, it's the first one on their debut album. And this one really lovely incorporates rock and blues together in one track which I really really enjoyed. We also have a track like Serenade for a Kaku which is one that basically features Ian Anderson just flexing on the flute. Now although he flexes and it sounds kind of nice, knowing what he would later do with the flute just amazes me to see that this is like him in the beginner level let's say. He has some of his signature moves where you know yells into the flute and blows very very hard basically like shredding everyone's ears but just on a flute but it's still not on the level you expect later on down the road. But if I had to choose a favorite I'd actually choose the song called Dharma for One which is a really lovely track but there is one thing about it which makes it a definite favorite of mine and it's much like yesterday's album actually it has a big drum solo on it and you know unlike yesterday's album I would have to argue that the drum solo found on here despite being shorter is definitely better. So Clive Bunker is actually playing the drums on here and he's been playing with the band since the beginning all the way up until Aqualong and I actually haven't really paid any attention to him on Aqualong itself and it's quite a shame because he probably plays pretty good I just didn't really put my time and effort into really you know getting into the drumming itself but this drum solo on here is just marvelous it is so virtuosely made I don't know if that's a word but I just said it it's really really fast it's really fun it features so many different ideas and it just ties everything together and it makes this particular song very very much enjoyable to listen to but here's a fun fact to you and it doesn't have anything to do with the drumming actually when it comes to the Anderson versus Abram situation we actually got one very very interesting track on this album in particular we actually have the only song in the entire discography the lengthy discography of the great Jethro Tull which doesn't have lead vocals by Ian Anderson alone. The track itself is called Move On Alone and it's definitely very interesting to hear a Jethro Tall song where there's only one person singing and it's not Ian. And you know what? I'm not ashamed to say it. It's a pretty fun song and I really really liked it and I think it's one of the best ones from this entire album. But all in all this album really isn't here for the prog. I'm not looking to you know get into it because I want to get to amazing prog music. Whenever I do listen to a band and an album that is supposed to be prog and I just find out that it isn't I get quite disappointed but I kind of knew going into this one that it wasn't going to be what I wanted it to sound like mainly because it was made before prog was established as an idea and definitely because this is in essence a blues album but seeing as I am under acquainted with blues music I actually had a pretty fun time listening to this one and you know I should really listen to more blues what do you say can we do like a 365 days of blues next year and of course I'm very very grateful for the fact that yes Mick left the band and actually you know didn't continue on with the blues direction he wanted to go in and just let Ian do his thing and go into the realm of prog. I am so happy that they did it because we eventually did get one of the best if not the best progressive rock band of all time and I love their music I love what they do and you can definitely hear some of the origins from this album you know culminating in very tiny little lumps further down as you go into their discography. So this is a nifty little cover. I think it's pretty nice. I really like the colors used on it. I really like the costumes and the makeup making them into old men. But the thing is, I can't for the life of me tell who Ian Anderson is. He has a very distinct type of face, but for some reason I don't know what they did on here. I just really can't tell who 
he is. Of course, I can't tell the other band members, but I don't know what they look like at all, so I don't really have any indication. I can tell you exactly what type of dog breeds you can see laying at their feet, but for the life of me, I'm just too dumb to recognize the faces of the actual people. And yeah, this cover is pretty quirky and it somehow works. You know, if you're gonna do a cover of a band, do something interesting with it. Do something like this. You know, everything from the bizarre expressions to the camera angle, to the outfits, to the colors, to the dogs, to the, you know, title, everything doesn't really feel like it's supposed to connect, but it does, and it culminates to a very interesting and quite memorable cover. And you know, we don't really get to see a lot of covers on here that really feature only the band members on it, but if I had to choose one which I think was done the best, I'd have to go with this one. So yeah, this album, it isn't prog, but it's definitely fun, so I'm gonna have to look at it quite subjectively and tell you all that my rating for it would be a 7 out of 10. But that's about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be listening to The Magician's Birthday by Uriah Heep. I of course wanna thank my lovely supporter over on Patreon, so thank you so much to Clay Walnum, you are the best, and if any of you wanna support me over on Patreon, you can find the link down in the description or in my about page. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.